to the July 7th meeting of the Harwich Council on Aging, our first live meeting in well over a year, and it truly is so great to see everyone's faces not in a tiny little box. I know, <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and now with everyone here and everyone's smiling face, we can see if you're paying attention or if you're going <laughs> off screen or yeah, stop right. video. I know, this is, this is true. Can't get away with anything anymore. <laughs> so it really is so wonderful. Thank you for getting a meeting in person for us. Absolutely. Arranged. It, it really right. is so wonderful to see everybody. Um, uh, our first order of business will be to call for a motion for approval of the minutes of our June 2nd, 2021 meeting. So moved. It has been moved. Is second. there a second? Second. Seconded by Joanne. Is there any discussion, alterations, or changes to those minutes? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And I don't have to call for a roll call <laughs> anymore. This is <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> this really is. Um, I note that we are uh, meeting in the Channel 18 studio, <clears throat> and there is nobody with us here for public comment, so I will move forward. And normally this is where I would check in with everyone, and I did that just before the meeting to see every, how everyone's doing. I wanted to give an update. I was invited to a program of my elder services on elder abuse, the elder coalition, what it, basically what it was, elder abuse coalition. And um, we had the entire Cape delegation with us. And again, it was one of those Zoom meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was one of the panelists. We had three. One couldn't make us. It was two of us. And I talked about what we're doing here mm -hmm. and some of the things that this community is doing, both from a Council on Aging standpoint, from a Board of Assessors, and what they were looking for, were, where are the gaps in services? Where are the gaps in services for seniors on the Cape? and trying to identify those so that elder services can start addressing them. Um, I don't know if you've been aware, we had an issue um, late spring, um, a resident of the community who's very visible um, was going to become homeless. And um, we involved both um, Suji Sell, our town nurse, we involved elder services, but what came as a bottom line, an end result, was that there was no option to place this gentleman temporarily or even in an emergency. A couple of the business owners got together and, and were able to work a couple hotel rooms. But there's no stock gap. And the only option for this gentleman, who is a Harwich native, okay, who had grown up here, family here, was to go to a shelter in Hyannis. That was the extent of the services. Oh. So we talked about that program. And as we're in the midst of summer, and loads and loads of, of, of visitors and guests and people going to restaurants and shops and beaches and so forth, we don't realize that there is homelessness in elder homeless in our community. And this one was, yeah. Carol knows the story, um, very visible. And I think for some of us business owners who are downtown, literally seeing it in front of us, you know, we have to act. And I, I want to give a lot of credit to Sue Jusell, our town nurse. Mm -hmm. She was great. The gentleman did not have a phone. She got him an emergency phone. Um, he doesn't like to use it. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, just checking in on him. Um, he has been stabilized through the summer at this point, which is great. The other thing we talked about is, again, at this time of year, when our tourists are here, everyone's oh. happy, it's, it's a wonderful time, the invisible poor among the elderly in our community. And we talked about the programs that we have done both from Council on Aging, meeting the needs of you know, nutrition, socialization, transportation, et cetera. We talked about what we've done from the town, from an assessor standpoint of helping. And what they asked me to speak about was filing legislation on behalf of the town with our Cape delegation. We have the highest senior tax credit in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we got that by filing legislation through Sarah Peake's office. Unfortunately, it was done as a home rule. I would have liked to have done it so that any city or town in the Commonwealth could have utilized mm -hmm. it, allowing any senior who qualifies. And the qualifications, to be honest with you, are not great. I mean, what, what people have to earn is minimal. That they can get up to a $1,500 tax credit. The law allows for 500 
Some communities have voted to double it to 1,000. We are at the highest at 1,500. So we talked about the process of filing legislation, and the Cape delegation was wonderful. They are there to hear the needs and concerns of their constituents and their communities. And because we're Cape Cod, and some say now we're becoming the New Hamptons with just the influx that we've had of, of, of tourism to the Cape, we can't forget those who we serve on this board. And we're going to need to continue to look at where the gaps are in services to try to address them the best that it can. Other Services is doing a great job trying to do it. Um, the other gentleman talked about a lot of the basics that we talk about all the time here. The takeaway from me for this event was what a great job we're doing here in Howard. The opportunities we have through our Council on Aging, through our director, having in essence a full-time town nurse, having in essence a full-time feeding program, having a transportation program, having a town through the, the uh, assessing department that will address those who cannot afford to pay their taxes through a number of programs. We're doing a really good job. And the person I think who asked me to get involved is based in Howish, and I think they wanted to show that, mm -hmm. that any town or community in the Cape can really do the same thing. It's a commitment of the community to get it done. Mm -hmm. So it was a very interesting program. There were a lot of questions, um, some, some good questions from the Cape delegation on, on looking at further service that they can provide, and especially when they look at the infrastructure package that's happening federally and what's going to be happening statewide, mm -hmm. where they can assist. So. It was a great program. I hope they're going to do it um, on a yearly basis. Whether or not in the panel, I would like to be involved. I'd like to have one of us involved in it mm -hmm. to bring back things that we can implement here. Mm -hmm. So I, I was tickled with it. I was honored to be asked to serve. Um, and it makes me proud of our Council on Aging, mm -hmm. our Council, our Director, our Town Nurse, our Chef, the entire staff that we have here. And truly the great things that are being done in this community. So congratulations <laughs> for the work you're doing. Okay, any questions about that? If not, we'll move forward. I will turn it over to Emily for overview of current operations, which things are changing. Things certainly are changing, and I am thrilled about it. Um, so July is marking the first month where we're resuming more on-site programs. So more than just the one-to-one -one professional services, we have brought back some of our small groups. Um, I'll say we are taking things more slowly than other town departments are, and we're doing that in consultation with the health department and with administration, um, and by and large consistent with what the other CAPE COAs are doing. I do want to kind of give an update a little later on what it looks like across the CAPE for programming, but I'll be Harwich specific first. Um, so we are bringing back, again, these small group programs. They are in the newsletter, um, which should be reaching folks this week if they haven't received it already and has gone out by email and the website as well. Um, so we're focusing on what we're categorizing as lower risk activities. So basically anything that's not kind of high intensity fitness and not our congregate on-site meals. Um, in lieu of bringing meals back here, we are continuing our community lunch distribution program. So we're still at our full 70 person per day capacity. I'd say each day is hovering now probably around 65. Um, and we're committed to onboarding new folks kind of for the duration. So if anyone still has an unmet nutrition need, we're still bringing new folks into the program. Um, I've been working really closely with our finance director, Carol Coppola, on the funding piece of it. So this program, since it began in March of 2020, has been supported through FEMA funding. And we expect that to continue at this point through the end of September. So our plan um, is to kind of continue the community-based model while we have the funding available, and then to transition you know, back to an on-site model. Um, in ordinary non-pandemic times, our on-site meals are supported through our municipal budget, and we have enough funding for about 40 meals per day. So it'll be a significant decrease in our capacity once we lose the FEMA funding and transition back to our more normal um, lunch and you know breakfast right. and dinner model, mm -hmm. but that always had a, a lower you know that has always mm -hmm. met the interest and the need for our sure. on-site model. We've had higher need since pandemic, so we kind of expect things to be in sync with need and interest and funding. 
Um, so we're, again, targeting. Um, that was our town chef who prepares those meals who just walked by. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, so again, that's kind of our plan for that um, meal program. And for the higher intensity fitness classes, we're also targeting a fall start. So we're taking things slowly for now. So we have mahjong book groups, movie days. We have some one-time educational programs. We're doing a Medicare fraud workshop. Um, I'm really excited that we're continuing our partnership with Pleasant Bay Community Boating. Um, Pre-pandemic, they had always offered you know, a one-day intro to sailing class for Harwich seniors offered free of charge where they got to go out on the bay. Um, it's especially a draw for folks who have never had the opportunity sure. to be on a boat, which is a, is a surprising number of people, even lifelong Cape Codders, don't get out on a boat. Sure. Um, so we're really excited for that. That's actually next week on the 15th. Um, so we are bringing back these things that get the community together, get folks interacting, um, like we have the opportunity to do today. And people have been really excited and grateful and eager to be back. Um, so we're very excited about that transition. And again, we'll be scaling up further in the fall. I do want to let you know and let the public know, um, part of our delay is we've actually lost a lot of our group leaders. There are folks who maybe are still hesitant to come back for health or safety reasons, or who just don't want to leave their program anymore. People have retired, they've moved away, they've found other ways to fill their time. So some popular programs won't be coming back, at least not with the same instructor, and that's not a COA policy or decision, that's just kind of how the cards have landed. Um, so we are actively recruiting for new program leaders. Um, I'd say especially seated exercise programs. We've lost a mindful yoga class, a gentle yoga class, our healthy for life class. Those are all things that won't be coming back. Um, Just I, before I forget, I think that's great. And I want to see, I hear some of the programs we're losing and we have opportunities, but is it also an opportunity to say, what are some additional needs that we have in those programs? and an opportunity for us to get out to the general public as things are coming back. We're looking for some new blood. We're looking for some new leaders in the following that we're replacing, but here are some other opportunities as well. Definitely, so I've already been in contact with VNA, and VNA um, does has a more active programming role in some other councils on aging, mm -hmm. so I'm excited to hopefully introduce some VNA programs, which are a lot of those evidence-based programs, the matter of balance, aging mastery, chronic disease, disease self-management that haven't been offered here for a while, that they have the training and the credentials and the certifications and would be interested in bringing uh, to the Harwich Council on Aging. So I'm working with their coordinator now to target some fall starts for those types of programs. And certainly if you know anyone in the community is listening and is interested in leading a program, um, we'd love to, to have them reach out. We do require, you know, credentials. They have to be certified if it's a program that requires certification. Mm -hmm. They do have to carry liability insurance and name the town as additionally insured. So there are some requirements that do take a little while to work through. So really, the sooner we can make those connections with folks who are interested, the better. Um, so we're very proactively looking to kind of expand our offerings, fill gaps for things that we're losing, um, and bring new folks on board. Emily, are those the VNA? Are they self-funding programs? They are. Okay. Yeah. And is there a template for someone who wants to become a program leader of exactly what needs to be done? We do have a, a COA program sponsorship policy that does outline, you know, the certification requirements, mm -hmm. the you know how they operate their funding and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I have that readily available for anyone who's interested. So it's great for anyone who is watching this program today. If you have an interest in running a program please reach out to Emily Mitchell here at the Council on Aging. Um, and it's a great opportunity for us to get, expand potentially some of those programs to see where the needs are. I want to go back really briefly to, to our feeding program. With things changing and as it will change this fall, do you see an additional um, load on people who will be joining our program in person? You know, it's really hard to anticipate. So a lot of folks who utilized our on-site meal program pre-pandemic are not utilizing our distribution program, and a lot of people using the distribution program are entirely new to us. So I think that'll be uh, a learning curve to see who's coming in, who, you know, now their nutrition needs are met the way they were pre-pandemic, and they're going to, you know, revert back to what those options were. Um, so I'll be curious to see how it plays out. I think we'll have to have you know really diligent and specific sign up processes so it's not so Linda knows exactly how much to prepare and purchase sure. and those types of things 
Um, so I do expect a learning curve for, for how that will play out. And I think that we look at anticipated budget implications should that occur. Right. And, and to be honest with you, the socialization is so important from that program. I would oh, love yes. to see it max out the best we can, and, and we'll, we'll find the money somewhere. I would say, you know, anytime we are... Oh, sorry. Ralph. Any plans for the men's breakfast and women's yeah. breakfast? <laughs> I would say the two things that I get asked the most are about the men's breakfast in particular and about Charlie Abate's senior fit class. Yeah. And, of course, those are the two things that have a delayed start. Um, so people aren't always thrilled when they hear that answer from me. Um, so I would think we'll probably start with the smaller lunch meals and then bring back. But I would love by October to have... Um, men's and women's breakfast I'm, back I'm in. I'm so glad that you, and thank you for bringing it up, Ralph. I was asked twice yeah. yesterday, yeah. why can't you start it now? Yeah. <laughs> I've had those same kinds yeah. of questions. Yes. <laughs> I thought you had some juice there, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Linda might actually kill me if I tried to bring back on-site and community-based things at the same time. Um, well, you know, and it, I wouldn't blame her. <laughs> but it, actually, there's, there's a serious component to that. The socialization part of that is so important. Oh, really? And uh, one of the unintended consequences of going through COVID, what I have seen, and Carol, I'm sure you've seen <clears> as well, with, I work with a lot of seniors, not only through my role here, but in, in my business. Um, a lot of depression. A lot of folks who have been dealing with some short-term memory issues and that socialization is such a part of people's everyday lives and, and, and being away from it for so long it has had major impacts I've had three people move because of dealing with both the isolation the depression that occurred because of it and they've moved closer to family because they just they, they, they could no longer deal with it. Yeah, there's lingering hangover from that, with, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of people very reluctant to come back into socializing or mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. getting to getting involved in groups and so forth. So, I mean, you see it even in the grocery stores, mm -hmm. you know, with the uh, phoning in your, you know, oh, sure. groceries and what yeah. have you. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of really reluctant, you know, to step back over that line again. I, yeah, I've seen a lot of it. Not, not, not good. And I think these things will impact us, you know, mm -hmm. as we move forward in the next year, you know, addressing some of those needs and more importantly, if people are aware of that, you know, to let us know, you know, that, that we do have programs, we have follow-ups that can be done, that if people are out in the community, isolated, and, and they want a friendly face or a friendly uh, voice to hear in the phone, we have programs that we can address with that. I think part of the problem was, you know, that it was such a fear thing that was promoted for so long, you know, the, the fear was just ingrained. I, I see it in children, too, which is really disturbing, but, and then all of a sudden, it seemed all of a sudden, compared to the lead-up, the masks were gone. Now it's okay. And and everyone was very skeptical about, you know, how, how did this happen, how come? <laughs> you know, I mean, what, what, was the, what was the news here that wasn't there before? So I think that's a big part of the problem, and there's a lot of distrust, you know, and skepticism. I, I, I see it all the time with people as they, they see someone for the first time as a toy shake hug or I'm vaccinated. You yes, know, uh, exactly. That, that, that's not, no, hi Ralph, nice to see you. I'm vaccinated. Yes. Are you? <laughs> that's the greeting. Yeah, exactly. I know, I was, My elbow was a sore from those. tattooed up here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it's a transition time. And again, think of, you guys are active, you're involved locally, you know, all of you have, have mm -hmm. got socialization. But to those folks who are living alone, who don't have that, and mm. to understand how that impact may be for them. So I think it's important that we continue to work on it as, 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 as we can open, oh, yes. you know, more so to get people back together. It will be important. I'll say from the COA side, we've certainly seen the full spectrum. There are folks who still are largely homebound, either due to COVID or for, you know, pre or separate from COVID reasons, um, people who aren't comfortable coming back out, people who do want to come out but want to come out masked and want to be in groups with people who are confirmed to be vaccinated. And there are people who would come and sit with 100 people without their masks on close together and are very comfortable in that mm -hmm. setting, you know, as has been advised. Um, so we're doing our best to kind of meet people where they're at uh, all along that spectrum. Um, and so that's part of why we are being more cautious than, again, some other folks. We've I mean, I've personally reiterated ad nauseum for the last 16 months that older adults are um, at the highest risk for serious consequences from COVID. And so we're still, you know, not everyone is vaccinated. Not everyone can be vaccinated. 
as a town-wide, we're not asking people to disclose their vaccination status. So in large part, we're acting as if anyone in a group is not vaccinated. And so how can we be as safe um, and healthy and engaged as possible? Um, so we are kind of, again, working all along that spectrum and that's why it's a little slower. Um, but I think we do have programs and services to meet people all along that continuum. Um, so yes, we are seeing all of it. And I'd say we've noticed a lot of um, the isolation, the depression, a lot of declining you know, balance and physical health. People are falling more, people are using rescue more. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that become really apparent um, now that people are interacting with the public more or interacting with professionals more. Um, so it's definitely a, a transition period for us. Um, so to that point, I did just want to reiterate again for the public that we're not asking people about their vaccine status for any Council on Aging program. Um, and we are recommending continued mask use, but not requiring it, except under really specific circumstances. So per state and federal policy, it is still required that people coming in for healthcare related programs mm -hmm. wear masks. So that's our podiatry programs, our dental clinic, and our town nurse wellness clinic. So anyone coming in for that is required to wear a mask. And same for transportation. So that is a continued mm -hmm. requirement for both drivers, volunteers, and passengers. Um, so folks just to be on, kind of on notice about that, that requirement. Um, but everything else is just kind of a recommendation. In terms of transportation, have you um, upped the number of people on the buses? So we're up from two to three. <laughs> <laughs> Big change. <laughs> Big change. Um, and that's, again, really consistent across the board for Councils on Aging. Um, I expect to be at four in the coming weeks, um, probably not higher than four for a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. Our, so we, we're still using our eight passenger van, so that's still, you know, 50% capacity is better than we were at for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and in light of our reduced capacity, we have, you know, expanded the location, so we're still going to pharmacies and post office and some of those trips that were um, covered, say, by the Friends bus in the past or that people had um, more accessibility to. So we're expanded locations, we're covering medical appointments on our van because our volunteer medical program is still on hold. Um, so the van is very, very active and has a very full schedule, um, just the reduced capacity. Okay. Um, yes. Quick question on the lunches. Are there still all things for people who would like lunches delivered? There are. That's what yes. I understood. Yeah, okay. for every day of the week, I yeah. believe, right now. Okay. Yes. Um, and then I did just want to kind of touch on what other councils on aging are doing. I've tried to, you know, uh, situate our policies in that broader context. And we had our last regional COA directors meeting maybe two weeks ago. And I was surprised by the variability. Um, there are some councils on aging that have been given the green light to be fully open. So every activity they had offered in the past is resuming on site without mask restrictions, um, activity restrictions. Who's giving them the green light? It's, so they're being made by their town administrator or gotcha. manager um, or select board. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, I'd say the next tier is like probably we are where masks are recommended but not required. There's a resumption of on-site programs, but not all on-site programs. Um, so I'd say we're kind of in that second tier. I'd call the third tier places that are partially open. So they've been fully closed to the public until now, doors locked, um, no one-on-one -on -one programs, et cetera. So partially open or maybe open to one-on-one. -on -one, so kind of a step back from where we are now. Um, and then there are some councils on aging that are still fully closed to the public entirely. Um, so I'm kind of breaking them down into those four tiers mm -hmm. or quarters. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say it relates, I've noticed a strong correlation to town size. So I'd say mm -hmm. Falmouth, Mashby, Barnstable, those are the towns that are kind of fully open to the public and they have the space and the capacity to do so. Um, I'd say kind of our mid-sized towns are where we are and then mm -hmm. some of the smaller and outer Cape towns are you know, maybe open a couple of days a week or restricted hours or not open at all. Um, so there's really a wider range now where we had been pretty consistent across the Cape, across the board until now. Um, so I'd say we're still in the more open range, although again, not the same as the Falmouth and the Barnstable and the Mashpee. Um, so it is, so people from different towns will notice really different services and programs available at their local council on aging. And that's just kind of reflective of the 
the administrators and the policies and the staff capacity in each of those places. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give that, that context in case you had questions or saw things in other towns. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to report was just our volunteer um, status. So I'm really excited. We did find someone to help the resident, our legally blind resident who needed grocery assistance. We found someone to meet that need, which is wonderful. Um, and we've had, I think, two new Shine volunteers and possibly oh, a returning great. Shine volunteer, which was a gap we'd had for probably going on a year at this point. Wow. Um, so they've gone through training. We're working with the regional Shine office to bring back on-site Shine counselors. They're making that decision at the statewide level, so it's not they're not making town-specific decisions. Um, so as soon as kind of they're ready to come back, we're ready to welcome them back and excited to have them back. I think people are excited for those face-to-face -face meetings again. Sure. Um, but I'm excited that we'll have some new Harwich-specific volunteers to provide that really invaluable counseling to our residents. Um, so those two needs have been met, which I'm really excited about. We are still looking for some reception help. Um, still need reception still help. Need still need some reception help. help. We've had some people reach out. We've had some people start, but we're just still seeing some gaps. Um, and you can do it. I know you were looking for a couple days a week. What is a minimum requirement that you would need for help? Um, so one shift is about three hours. Um, so a minimum would be the three hour um, kind of block. Yeah. Um, and we'd be open to anyone who wanted to commit up to two or three shifts of that three hour block. So up to say nine hours okay. a week. Mm -hmm. yes. So we still have that. Yeah. We do, yes. If any of you are, I know Ralph is prolific on his social media use, but <laughs> the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> if anyone else out there on social media, and, and when you meet with other people, just spread that word. Because um, I know the, um, the Cultural Center on Session Road, they had had some need for, and they picked up a few people there as well. Wasn't quite as extensive a time right. and maybe not as, um, the requirements are not as, as strict. Mm -hmm. However, I, I think there are folks out there who do want to get involved. So would you please spread that? <laughs> and if those of you who are watching, Council on Aging does need reception help. If you're willing to help out minimum three hours a week, please call Emily Mitchell. Emily, remind folks the number here at Council on Aging. Sure, it's 508. 430-7550. Give us a buzz anytime. We're happy to talk with you about volunteering or anything else. A <laughs> um, couple of things for me, and, and I don't know if you have more on your update, but... Just one last okay, thing, but I can wait. No, 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 please. I, I'm I, probably going to address the issue. Oh, okay. Well, I just, I had forgotten. Um, but we, this community compilation project. So back in the fall, we received grant funding from Elder Services, um, and the, the concept was to do a creative outreach project. Um, so we were soliciting contributions from older adult Harwich residents to in some way capture their pandemic experience. So it could be something they've discovered about themselves, a new skill or hobby or recipe they've learned, or it could be a reflection on some of the loss or hardship or the, you know, the negative parts of COVID. We wanted to fully capture the, the whole experience for our Harwich community. Um, we had targeted March for, for getting this out and then, you know, vaccine rollout hit, so it was delayed a little bit, but we have now the final project. Um, so I have copies here for everyone to take home. Um, we had about 50 contributions to the program, again, capturing that full range. We have poems and journal entries and photographs and drawings. I mean, just really the full gamut of, of contributions. Um, we are hoping to do some kind of event to distribute these as well as to put copies just at community locations. So we have copies here. We'll be mailing out copies to anyone who submitted to the project and then we'll have copies available throughout the community. So I just wanted to extend my gratitude to folks who submitted um, and my excitement about this project coming together and my eagerness to get it out there. So it is ready, it is available, and will you know, to be determined when we can have a, a nice celebratory kind of uh, rollout of the, the final project. So I'm very excited about that. Angie. This is a great job. I'm just curious, you said you got it from a grant. Is this something that might be continued throughout the year, like with other, not so just on COVID, but maybe they could... So this was funding that Elder Services got that was COVID specific. Um, it was through the CARES Act. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't expect this particular pool of funds to be available, but they do have grant opportunities, you know, on an ongoing basis um, that we'll certainly be on the lookout for. But I think this was kind of a specific pool of money that they gave to local COAs. Um, yeah, so I'm really very just tremendously grateful to the folks who, who participated in it. And you, great point, and, and, and I know the newest member of the Board of Selectmen 
has had tremendous experience um, writing grants for yeah. Yeah. her previous position. Yeah. And um, you know, if we do have a need at some point for a specific project, then we we will most certainly. I don't know. She's not our liaison. I don't believe. But I'm sure talk we could reach out to her. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple of connections that uh, we could ask for her assistance because she's brilliant when yeah. it comes to grant writing. I just think that, that lots of times when the elders see it, right? You know, they see their name or whatever. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah it, it, that would be a great program sometime for the community journal yeah to say let's read a few of the stories well definitely yeah. yes i would love to do that i yeah. think that would be <laughs> magnificent and right. the same thing is to get people tune in to community journal and yeah. hear their story i think oh, that I would know. be wonderful yeah, yeah. great Perfect. idea thank yes. you for that yeah such a brilliant woman over there <laughs> <laughs> you know, the schools miss her <laughs> <laughs> does anybody have anything else on emily's update i have a couple of quick questions sure um have we straightened out language for the 14 passenger van? Um, it is currently with CCRTA going through their council, so no would be the so short answer. We haven't worked out the contractual obligations yet to make that available, and uh, we're getting there. Um, do you want to update on anything operationally relative to staffing? or? Um, unfortunately, I don't have much to report there. Okay, <laughs> okay. well, moving on. Moving on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the report. Um, and all your hard work. Yeah, I, I know this has not been an easy time, and, and you've done a great job with it. Um, any old business to come before us today? Yeah. Not in the form of old business, but a question. To, in the Cape Cod Times this morning, there was a, an article about Council on Aging Nutrition Sites that are handing out food stamp uh, or food uh, coupons. Are we involved in that? We were not named. So that's actually so you're, uh, uh, the farmer's market coupons, exactly. is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yeah. So that is an elder services program. Mm -hmm. So councils on aging, where there is a congregate meal site organized through elder services. Right. So ours is operated independently. Other councils on aging have on-site meals coordinated through elder services. Okay. Um, so I did check in with Hillary, who operates the elder services meals on wheels site. She has in the past gotten some coupons. She does not anticipate getting any this year, but Harwich residents are eligible to go to any of the other sites. Okay. So Harwich residents can go. I think the closest is the actual Elder Services Office in Dennis, mm -hmm. um, but I know there are some other COAs um, right. that are offering them. So they're first come, first serve. Um, it's a $25 coupon to farmers markets for seniors coordinated through Elder Services. Um, so they can't get them here, but Harwich residents are eligible to get them elsewhere. Great, thank you. Great point, and, and just I'm, I'm going to give a plug because of, of the programs that are being done by the Family Pantry of Cape Cod, that they have expanded what they are doing in terms of fresh uh, fruits and vegetables that is available. And, and I know Chris Menard and, and a number of the members of the board who are involved, um, that program has really um, gained great traction. And those who may miss out on a program like that should contact the Family Pantry of Cape Cod. Um, I know that Ralph has a couple connections up there and most certainly could put people in touch with the right folks. And just to piggyback off of that, we are still, um, since the onset of the pandemic, we've been placing pantry orders <coughs> on folks' behalf and then our van driver picks them up and delivers them to people at home and that is ongoing as well. So we do those distributions on Tuesday afternoons. So as long as folks give us a call by, you know, say before three on Monday afternoon, we can place that order for them. They can, you can choose what you want, you just don't have to go and actually do the, the shopping and we'll deliver it to you right at home. So that's ongoing as well. Yes. We're so fortunate to oh, have that in that this community and, and the programs with Absolutely. the COAs that are out there, it really is tremendous. Absolutely amazing. Okay, at this point, if there's nothing else I'm gonna go around the room, I'm gonna start with my Friend Carol, <laughs> anything you want to say? I have nothing, Richard. Nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm recovering, so I'm... <laughs> and remember, limp so people know you are recovering. <laughs> I am, I am. I, I, I know. I'll, I'll be sure to limp. <laughs> Great to see you. Thank Angie. you. Thank you. Uh, no, I just want to thank everybody for all their hard work. This has been going oh, well. And, I, and as you said, I was very, very proud of our Council on Aging. I think we do an awful lot. I really do. Thanks, Angie. I agree 100%. Mm -hmm. Just to say that it's good to see everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Emily, of course, you're doing a super job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Joanne? Uh, I don't, I'm just so happy to be in person meeting oh, and able to, you know, it 
it's different when you can look at somebody and, and say what you it want to say. Is. And it definitely wanna, is. And everybody looks horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know, really. <laughs> unless, unless you, you, see unless you know how to create those lovely <laughs> backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> We have someone in our office that knows how to do that, and every time we have Zoom meetings, you know, it's it's the Hawaiian Islands or it's the Alps, and I'm, like, and I'm going, oh, all I have is you know, the drab walls. But I assume we're calling this the resumes meeting, right? <laughs> yeah, very good. Very good. I like it. Uh, just that I'm very grateful to see all of you and very grateful for the chance to see folks we haven't oh. seen in, you know, 16 months. So I hope folks come in and come say hi and come join our program. Yeah, grateful it's, to uh, you. You know, and, and for those who are tuning in for the first time and, and seeing our meeting, you know, please check out the newsletter that is on our table here that's available to anyone in the community that lists all of the programs that are available here at the Council on Aging and programs in our community like the Family Pantry Program. Um, we really do have so much to offer, not only uh, our seniors, but their caregivers and their families as well. So if anyone is tuning in, please get a copy of the newsletter from the Council on Aging. It is packed full of information. Um, it truly is great to see everybody. And I want to give my thanks to the staff at Channel 18 for televising our meeting today. And uh, if there's nothing else, I will hesitatingly entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed can clean up the room afterwards. <laughs> <laughs>